the weekend and I have a number of things on my checklist, things that I really want to be able to put a great big check mark by at the end of the weekend. And I'll tell you what they are. Nothing's real major, but they are things that are very timely to be doing right now. Now I'm in zone 7B, as you guys know. You guys are in different zones, so your checklist is probably different than mine. So if you would, in the comment section below, please put the things that are on your checklist. Make sure to put where you garden so other people who garden in your same area know what things they should be doing. It's especially helpful for all of the new gardeners that follow here and really read your comments very attentively. So the number one thing that I'm going to kind of put on my checklist and hopefully mark off is this. I want to make sure that this year, it's, I've, I've said it earlier, it's been a banner year for Larkspur and for self-seeders in general. Now, all Larkspur is not equal in my garden. Some of it comes up, most of it comes up in this kind of purpley blue color, but some of it comes up in pink, some of it comes up in white, and then some of it comes up in a really deep purple. Once the flowers are gone, I'm not gonna remember which was the pretty color whose seed I want to save to make sure that I have more of it next year. So here is a little trick. I get these little key tags from Office Depot or you can get them off of Amazon. I'll try to put a link below. And what I do is I write on there what color it is. So I am marking the very specific seed head that I want to take seed from. So in this case, I might just put on here purple larkspur and then when it's not purple anymore and I and the seed has finally dried and is ready for me to harvest then I know exactly which seed head I want to take with exactly the color that I want to save and spread around or gift to others. Well, most of the larkspur isn't yet ready to harvest any of its seed. The seed is not dry, but it is starting to dry along these tall stems of the foxglove and also my columbine. And this is definitely seed that I want to save and spread around in different locations next year, especially from this stock, which was extremely happy this year, which tells me that it might be a really, um, really good, sturdy, reliable seed that I want to perpetuate. So what I'm going to do, here, here is a tip. I've got my, my little QVC caddy here to demonstrate. Now, when I save the seed, and I'm not going to do it today, this is just on my checklist for the weekend, but I'm going to take these seed heads. They have to be brown. you can see how fine that seed is. Okay, it's so fine that if I scattered it around, what typically happens is it just kind of falls in a clump and then all of the seedlings are very close together and they are very, very dense. In, in, they just grow together and then I have to thin them out and separate them. I don't want to have to do that. So here's what I do. When I package them up later, what I'll do is put them in an old spice jar or an envelope or something and I will mix that seed with some sand and then I can put that sand and that really fine seed in a little packet and when I gift it to someone or when I have it for myself then all I have to do is just shake that seed on the bare soil or if I've got it in an old spice jar or something I can literally season the bare dirt with some of my foxglove seed. The same trick works great with poppy seeds because they're also very, very fine. So get some builder sand and when you get ready to harvest all of your foxglove and poppy seeds, mix them with a little bit of sand. And now is the time because these seed heads, unlike the larkspur, are really starting to dry. You can also see they're not quite ready but this purple columbine, look at those beautiful black seeds. Oh, that makes me happy. Okay, this is gonna go to seed really, really vigorously. So this isn't quite as fine as the other seed, but let me show you what I do. 
So I've got this and it is scattered kind of throughout the front flower beds, but you'll see some areas where it's, it's heavier with self-seeders than with others. And if I want to encourage this columbine to grow in different areas, then what I'll do is I'll just take this seed and I'll just sprinkle it wherever I want more columbine to come up. And you can see right here that this area is pretty happy because there's a columbine right there and there's one right there. And it's almost time to really aggressively, there's some more seed heads back in there, Stuart, to more aggressively really harvest that seed. This is all purple. I have yellow in the back, so I wanna make sure that I mark that it's purple columbine when I put it in a package or I gift it to someone else. So it's all about starting seed harvesting this weekend. Might be premature where you live, but for me, we're just about there. Now, what I try to do is, if I take some seed and I wanna scatter it around, for example, the columbine, what I do is I take some of that seed and I scatter it around now. When it would naturally drop the seed in nature, I also save some seed for fall when I will scatter some around again because I never really know when moisture is going to come, when there's gonna be adequate conditions for germination. And so I like to cover my bets. So when I do that, I will scatter it when it would normally drop its seed and I will also scatter it in the fall well, it where it will then hopefully germinate over winter and come back in the spring. If you live in a colder zone, you might wanna save your seed to spread around in your gardens until in spring. Just tell me below um, in the comment section what your practices are in your zone. So now let's cover some other things on the checklist and go to the backyard. Well, it's all about flowers blooming in my garden right now, unlike at other times of year. Right now, it's about two o'clock in the afternoon. It's way too hot to be cutting any kind of blooms. They're not adequately hydrated to last. Once I bring them in, they won't stay fresh for very long. But I am going to put them on my checklist of things that I want to cut huge bouquets of to bring inside for Sunday. So. Number one, I'm really going to take advantage of those things that are extremely seasonal. So I've got this, I've got a scent amazing gardenia in the front that's in bloom right now. And I'm gonna treat myself to a little bouquet that I'm gonna put here, which will be just right where I can smell it and enjoy it as I walk around the garden. Another thing that I'm going to do is I'm gonna cut huge bouquets. This is one of the, the most simple, but one of my favorite cut flower arrangements to make. And it is nothing but just branches and bouquets of regular feverfew, not golden feverfew, but just the common variety. Now, I'm, you might say, well, why aren't you just leaving some of it in the garden? Well, because it's getting ready to go to seed. You can see here that some of it has started to lose its petals. And if it goes to seed, it will go to seed really aggressively. And I don't want it to, unlike the golden fever view in front, I like this stuff to be contained. But I do like to cut great big bouquets of this and put them in a galvanized metal pitcher that I've got in my kitchen. It is, it's a vignette that caught the attention of Victoria Magazine a number of years ago. They loved it and, and I think because of that relationship, I think of Victoria Magazine every time I cut these flowers. And so this time of year, whenever they are in perfect mint condition, I cut a great big bouquet to bring inside and place in my kitchen and sometimes upstairs by my bedside table. It's about to go to seed. It's about to be past its prime. So on my checklist is cutting huge bouquets of this fever view to bring indoors. Well, if you've been interested at all in starting uh, a topiary and kind of getting on the topiary craze 
train, then now is a great time to start because there's lots of plants available in your nursery and garden centers. Things are really putting out heavy, aggressive, really fresh growth right now. So when you form a topiary, when you trim it, when you try to determine what is going to be the central leader and the central stock, then definitely now is the time to do it because it will reward you. Um, it will reward you very well with all sorts of new foliage. These are all myrtle topiaries here. I know I haven't done any videos on, on topiary in a while and I'll try to remedy that and do something exclusively for you guys that really like topiary. But if you're wanting to make uh, your own specimen out of boxwood, out of euonymus, out of any kind of evergreen, out of myrtle, out of lavender, out of lantana, anything, then you probably want to be looking for what your candidates are going to be right now because now is the time to find them at nursery and garden centers. So if you're wanting to make more topiary forms, put that on your checklist for the weekend. Well, earlier in the week, I did a video on creating negative space as a really valuable design tool in the garden that's completely free. And I pruned up and back this viburnum, and then I revealed this wonderful green mountain boxwood that's underneath. Once I did that, I just in essence exposed it and kind of created more work for myself because now that I've got this revealed, I realize that it needs to be clipped back too. So that is on my weekend checklist is to really recapture the form of a lot of my boxwood spheres, cones, and some of my topiary shapes. So there you go. That is the next thing on my checklist. Well, last weekend I planted up a bunch of dahlia tubers from Brex and you can see that this one has already erupted. It loved the rain, it loved the heat. I've got a couple of eyes coming up. This one I pinched back. It's not quite to a foot tall but nevertheless I thought it was time for pinching. So if you've got dahlias coming up and you want more flowers versus larger flowers you might want to pinch those now. Now any type of bulbs that you have coming up whether they're dahlias or lilies and they're just really really starting to put on growth. You want to stake them and support them sooner rather than later, whether that's a tutor like this one, or it's bamboo, uh, bamboo stakes, or it might even be a tomato cage, whatever your support is, your support of choice, you want to put it in place sooner rather than later. So really this should be on all of our checklists and it should be on our checklist probably every weekend. And that is observe and record and take pictures and observe and record and take pictures, rinse and repeat because I try to identify things that are just unseasonal and uncharacteristic for this time of year so that I can look into future, you know, I can look back, I can look forward and I can see if there's some kind of pattern or if there really is uh, some kind of effect that's being driven by climate change or the weather or whatever. Now, this is a perfect example. It has been so cool and so rainy that my Chinese snowball viburnum is very confused. And look at all of the blooms it's still putting out. Not only are there blooms, but there's all sorts of buds that are still waiting to flower. This is very unusual for this time of year. It didn't bloom as heavily early on, maybe because of the Arctic blast, but now when I typically have no flowers at all, I've gotten this second burst of flowers and foliage. I find that absolutely fascinating. Another thing is typically by now, most of the larkspur is just about finished. Uh, most of the poppies are just about finished. Really, they've been going strong up till now, and they are just now starting to be into decline. So I'm gonna make sure that I mark that down in my garden journal. If you're not already keeping one, you might want to do so. I'll try to put a link to one of my favorite ones below. But that's something that we should all be attentive to. I'm bad about it, and I'm gonna try to be better about it, and that is record, observe, and take pictures. 
Well, it seems strange to me that I am just now having to water. Actually, I still don't have to water, but probably by tomorrow I will if it doesn't rain. And so what I'm gonna check off my list this weekend is something that's been bothering me for a long time. It's been really too wet to get out there and look into it, and that is I'm gonna check all of the connections on my hoses, on my hose end sprayers, where it connects to the valve on my house to make sure that there's no dripping water, to see if uh, the washers need to be replaced, and just make sure that everything is in good working order. And also do an assessment if there are things that I can buy or that I can switch around that might make watering a little less uh, obnoxious of a task. So I'm, go I'm going to do that. Now, here is where I really would like some input. A lot of times I'm responsible about it. I, I change out my washers, I do what I can, and I still can't get um, the connections to, connections to stop dripping and wasting water. So you guys out there that are, are more mechanical and, and better about that kind of thing than I am, if you would share any tips with all of us whom I am sure suffer from the same frustration. Now let's move on to the next thing. <laughs> I almost swallowed a gnat earlier and that time <clears throat> I think I may I may have actually swallowed one. So if I have to stop, forgive me. Now is a great time in your gardens to look for free stuff. And what do I mean by that? Well, I have all of a sudden, now that the weather has warmed up, I've started seeing little volunteers of tomatoes and peppers and marigolds and things like that almost everywhere. This is stuff that, I, how it survived minus 13 degrees in this Arctic blast, I don't know. Maybe it got uncovered when the soil was disturbed or squirrels expo exposed those seeds, whatever the reason. Now is a good time to be really attentive and hone your seed recognition skills to look for free stuff. So what do I mean by that? Well, honestly, I don't think I have bought a tomato in years. Most of the time I see them coming up in my garden. Most of the time they're a really well-performing cherry tomato, which is typically what I grow. Um, but if I find a start in my compost pile or whatever, I just transplant it and put it into the potager. Now I've got one in here right now. It's a little bit droopy because it's a recent transplant, but look, it already has flowers on it. And as soon as I harvest the rest of that Swiss chard, I will probably put another small tomato in there or maybe some basil. I'm really just gonna kind of play with some of the free stuff that I found in my own garden. And you may wanna use it in your garden, but you also might wanna share it with somebody else. It's especially a fun thing to do with kids. So always on my checklist, especially now and especially after a rain, is I want to be extremely attentive to any kind of foliar, that's hard to say, foliar damage that might indicate I've got some kind of pest problem. Now I already alluded to a little bit of a white fly issue that I think I've already started to notice. It's also been, tell me you guys if you're experiencing the same thing, I have never had so many earwigs. Now I don't think earwigs really do that much damage, they're kind of scary looking, I don't really like the way they look, but they do, I think, eat aphids. I think they might also eat uh, snails and slugs. So I don't worry about them too much. Not so sow bugs. Now I know there's an argument out there that sow bugs only move in and they eat foliage that is, uh, that is traumatized or that is starting to wilt or that's decaying or rotting. But I have found that not necessarily to be the case because I find a lot of times they are contributing to that rot and they're especially bad rot right after a rain. You can lift up almost anything that grows as a ground cover, like my creeping flocks up front or some kind of sedums or in your ajuga, and it will expose all sorts of roly polies and sow bugs. So in that case, I will use Captain Jack's dust, which I always have listed below. If you've got slugs and snails, I like sluggo, which is an uh, pelletized iron phosphate. So you might want to go 
to uh, your nursery or garden center and stock up on some of your organic controls. And while you're at it, don't forget neem oil for that white fly and spider mite. Well, last call. It's last call, you guys, uh, maybe for beer and drinks, but it's definitely almost last call around here in my Zone 7 garden for getting annuals in before it just gets too hot. Now, I look about 10 days out to see what the weather's going to be, but pretty soon we need to start getting those annuals in the ground so they can put out a really good substantial root system before the heat of summer comes in and really traumatizes them. So now where it's still kind of cool and rainy in areas, that if you're experiencing this kind of weather, take advantage of it. It's almost last call for you guys to get your seasonal annuals and that kind of color that's gonna be so important to you later in the year, it's almost last call. It's also a great time to seed things like uh, zinnias or cleome or cosmos. Any of those kind of tall sunflowers, those kinds of seeds that you want to grow into tall cut flowers, now is a great time to do it while there's still a chance of rain on the horizon. But you want to get them in and help them get established before it just gets too hot. For those of you who are not interested in this fashion epilogue, then now is the time to cut me off. For those of you that are, here is my ensemble for today. The top is kind of a, um, oh, it's got a real summery vibe, I think. This is a Marona top from Target that I've had for a million years. I wear it every summer. It's loose, it's cool, and I really love it. My earrings came from Burlington Coat Factory. Uh, I think there's a brand there called Sarah and Kate or something like that. These are a little glitzier than I normally wear because I am going to go to lunch, hopefully, with hubs because yesterday was our wedding anniversary. So we're going to try to do that. Um, the jeans are Abercrombie and Fitch. And my shoes, which I think are really cute, if I can get them off here, are Anthropology. And I've had these for years too. And they are Jasper and Jira, whatever that is. Anyhow, that is my ensemble for today. And it's comfy, it's cozy, just perfect for getting out and doing something on the weekend. Hope you guys have a good one.